For most of the 2022 Formula 1 season so far, the core reason for Mercedes lack of performance has been one specific problem, porpoising. A recent crucial breakthrough with that issue pointed to the world champion team finally starting to salvage its misfiring campaign. But it isn't as simple as that. One massive hurdle has been overcome, but Mercedes 2022 car still has other limitations that need to be addressed if either Lewis Hamilton or George Russell have any real hope of winning races this season. After getting on top of its porpoising problem in Spain, it was a big setback for Mercedes to be instantly hampered by impossibly bad bouncing once again in Monaco. That was leaving for an issue. Rather than being an aerodynamic phenomenon and a recurrence of the cause of its nightmare early races, the W13 simply couldn't handle the bumps of the Monte Carlo streets. The low speed and bumpy nature of Monaco put an emphasis on several key areas – ride quality, aerodynamic load and mechanical grip. After Mercedes performed so well in the high speed sections of the Barcelona track, Monaco was an excellent test of other car characteristics, and the W13 failed. At the start of the weekend, the car was bottoming out really badly. The team was able to ease that to a degree, but only by raising the rear ride height. And that took it to a level where the car was simply not producing enough downforce. The poor ride quality seems to be a legacy of the car's inherent stiffness. If anything, Mercedes porpoising breakthrough helped because it is more confident it can run the car slightly softer on the suspension. This is because it's no longer as worried about the car dropping lower and triggering the porpoising. But this clearly wasn't enough in Monaco, which hints at either the inherent stiffness of the suspension, the lack of travel in the current design, or possibly both. Even if the extent of the issue was worse than expectations in Monaco, it wasn't a total surprise to Mercedes as it knew its car still had inherent weaknesses. It also knew that it hadn't been able to make much progress in addressing these weaknesses, because most of its time and focus had been on curing the porpoising. For example, the ride quality was something that had been flagged by both drivers as early as the first preseason test in Spain. So Monaco didn't really tell Mercedes anything new in this regard. In fact, we understand that the first upgrades Mercedes will bring since curing the porpoising problem will include improving the car's ride quality. More load and a more stable car will go a long way and should also help with the chronic tyre warm-up issues that have blighted Mercedes on several occasions this year. This has been a big factor in qualifying. Despite having quite clearly the third fastest car, especially in races, Mercedes has often found another team between its lead car and the Ferraris and Red Bulls. In fact, that's happened at five of the seven Grand Prix so far. In simple terms, now Mercedes has got its core problem under control, it needs to create a better mechanical and aerodynamic platform. If that sounds obvious, it's because it kind of is. Unlike its rivals, Mercedes hasn't really developed its car much beyond what appeared in testing. While Mercedes' outlook may improve or worsen depending on specific track characteristics at the moment, one thing has been consistent all year, being third best. And the gap to Ferrari and Red Bull remains severe on qualifying pace, as this graph shows. The fact is that whether it's a good weekend like Spain or a difficult one like Monaco, Mercedes is so far away from Red Bull and Ferrari that it's not going to challenge either way. Team boss Toto Wolff called Mercedes' current pace deficit a huge annoyance, which is probably an understatement. Best case scenario, he reckons Mercedes is half a second off in qualifying with its current car. Worst case scenario, it's eight tenths away. Wolf says this is unacceptable. The caveat here is that Mercedes should cut that gap as it adds performance to its car, and it should have some low hanging fruit with its initial development. But there is still a question mark over the car's ultimate potential, especially in light of the underlying issues such as its stiffness that we outlined in the first part of this video. In addition to Monaco showing how much Mercedes is struggling with its suspension, we also may have some clues for why that is. With the new 18-inch wheel rims and shallower sidewall tyres that are stiffer both vertically and laterally in 2022, the suspension must compensate and allow more movement. This means it has more work to do. It looks like the rear suspension of the Mercedes is not working in line with the new stiffer tyres. Because also for 2022, clever hydraulic suspension trickery has been outlawed. This was an area in which Mercedes previously excelled, such as the inertia dampers that it ran front and rear on last year's car, basically doing the work in controlling any bouncing while the springs themselves had very little travel. Other teams seem to have been sharper at finding new solutions, with Russell particularly envious of how well the Ferrari seems to ride curbs and bumps at all tracks. Mercedes' sensitivity in these areas could also have impacted the porpoising it had suffered in the opening races, 
making it a mechanical issue, not just an aerodynamic one. So how much progress Mercedes can make with its 2022 car depends on exactly how much it needs to be changed. And there are still questions being asked of Mercedes about the current concept or if the focus needs to switch to readying a different design for 2023. Mercedes answer is that this will only be valid if the conclusion is it needs to make an architectural or aerodynamic change that cannot be implemented on the current car. What's clear is that the W13 still needs a lot of work. As Hamilton put it when asked if he'd prefer Mercedes to switch resources and focus to 2023, there's loads of things from this year's car that he doesn't want carried over to next year. Beyond a few podiums made possible by the retirement of faster cars, the only noteworthy element of Mercedes' results this year is Russell's unbroken run of top 5 finishes. In any other season since 2014, a return of two podiums in seven races would represent slim pickings for a Mercedes driver and the consistency of finishing in the top five would receive less applause. So it says much about Mercedes' plight this year that Russell's record not only makes him the team's lead driver in the championship in fourth ahead of Ferrari's Carlos Sainz, but also puts him 34 points ahead of his illustrious new teammate. In fact, Russell has now beaten Hamilton in every race since the season opener in Bahrain. And this, at least on paper, could present a threat to the team dynamic. But it hasn't been the kind of feather ruffling start it may appear to be because that run and the driver standings paint a misleading picture. Russell's strong performances have combined with Hamilton having a couple of uncharacteristic off-key weekends and being on the wrong side of fortune on more than one occasion. Hamilton should have finished ahead in at least three other races but lost out because of poorly timed safety cars in Australia and Miami and had a first lap collision with Kevin Magnussen in Spain. Over the years we've had plenty of encounters with a dismissive or downbeat Hamilton immediately after a session that has been below expectations. But so far this year, Hamilton seemed pretty relaxed in his post-qualifying or post-race media rounds. While he's not always the happiest, which is no surprise given the positions he's fighting for, he's always been complimentary of Russell and shrugged off his own struggles or misfortune. And when the best case scenario in terms of pure performance has been 5th or 6th, it's not as though the bragging rights within the team have been particularly valuable. So when the two drivers have been near each other on track, they've been completely sensible. And when things have gone badly for Hamilton, the stakes haven't been high enough for him to react poorly. Hamilton is still lauding the job his new teammate is doing and there seems no sign of internal disruption. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Wolf has said that one of the few highlights he's had this season is how his drivers have worked together with no friction to help Mercedes move up the grid. Whether that stays the same if Mercedes continues to improve its car and Russell is still ahead is an important question and we still need to discover the answer. But Mercedes would probably take a bit more tension between its drivers if it was the result of fixing the lingering problems it still has with its 2022 car.